This is Bloomberg Intelligence. We're really getting into now the streaming arms race. Dish is looking at that and saying we can really build a nice niche for ourselves. In-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. The dollar is the dominant concept in the planet. I think the acquisition is a natural progression of what Microsoft can do with this technology going forward. Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Over the next hour, we will dig into the big business stories impacting Wall Street and the global markets. Each and every week, we provide in-depth research and data on some of the 2,000 companies and 130 industries our analysts cover worldwide. Today, we take a look at the consumer staples sector. Will some key players be looking to make changes after a disappointing first half? Plus, we'll discuss Fed action going forward. What have we learned about what they may do heading into the fall? But first, the European energy crisis. A number of issues from low Rhine levels to Russian gas supply cuts have led to skyrocketing natural gas prices. How high will they go? To try to get a handle on the situation, we turn to Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Patricio Alvarez. Patricio, a really tough energy scenario in Europe uh, expected to get worse as winter begins. Just give us a lay of the land, how folks are thinking about it. Oh, thanks for having me, uh, Paul. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's a it's a good place to start. Would be to to look at the the gas supply scenario in Europe, which which has been consistently deteriorating over over the past few months. Um, as we all know by now, uh, Russia was the main uh, gas supplier for Russia uh, for for Europe, uh, contributing about forty percent of its supply in twenty twenty one. But since the war started, um, they have suppressed the uh, flows. Um, significantly since since the war started into Europe and now we're we're about 70 percent uh, down year to date in terms of uh, of how much uh, gas we're getting in fr- from Russia and this this situation is not looking like it's going to get fixed uh, this has demanded the continent to sort of turn towards the global LNG market and sort of pull all of all of this per cargoes it can away from Asia and other uh, regional hubs in order to to sort of meet that that shortfall um, nevertheless uh, this has resulted in, in a bit of the demand destruction already. We've seen uh, gas consumption in the first half of this year lower by about 15%, um, and that's mainly between uh, as a combination of both weather, so milder weather, milder winter, but also we've seen a capitulation of, um, of gas demand in industry. Um, so, so that's sort of where we are in terms of in terms of the supply scenario, very, very tight, um, very, very tight uh, gas demand balance, um, and we are seeing this sort of also flow through into the power uh, into the power price uh, sector as well, uh, and that's mainly because uh, the the highest um, marginal cost generation sets the price for wholesale power markets, and we've seen this sort of uh, augmented in, in the power prices as well. Right. Um, so that so that the big issue obviously is. Ukraine, Russia, uh, the decline in natural gas coming out of Russia. But then I also am reading things about the Rhine River in Germany being, you know, awfully low, such that barge traffic, including some energy products, be it coal or, or other energy, are kind of having some issues there. Is that also driving things up? That's right. That's right. So, so as as we said in the beginning, there's a big shortfall in, in gas supply. So, one of the measures that they use is sort of going towards is trying to supplement uh, or trying to uh, use other flexible generation sources such as coal. So basically you just burn coal instead of gas. So, so you sort of uh, curve uh, demand for gas there. But we've seen this uh, this extensive drought and, and heat waves um, across Europe causing this climate-related impact on, on the power sector. And one of them is that the low, um, the historically low uh, river levels in Germany are making it very difficult for, for hard coal supplies to arrive uh, on time towards uh, into the, the power lines that need them. We've seen a couple companies already flag that they may have irregular output from, from a couple of power plants that run on hard coal, but, but it, it is important to say that Germany does have its own supply uh, of not, not, not hard coal per se, but, but lignite. Uh, so lignite is a less uh, refined version of hard coal, uh, let's say, and, and those lignite, lignite mites, mines in Germany are quite close to, to most of the, the the power plant capacity there. So so it could be an issue only if this uh, sort of um, drought and, and heat waves extend beyond mid-September, uh, where, where, which is what the regulators are sort of seeing as, as the threshold for, for this wow. um, to turn into a critical situation. And then in France, I know France is a, a, one of those countries that uh, has relied on nuclear power more than many other countries, but 
I'm also learning that they need cool water to cool down the power plants. And with the heat, the water supply in France isn't cool enough. Is that also an issue? That, that is perhaps the most significant issue um, okay. in our view, because that, that will probably uh, create a shortfall in the longer term. And that's because uh, EDF has, is already contending with, with extended outages. Only about 43% of, of their, of their um, nuclear power fleet is, is online at the moment. And that's um, not only because of the heat waves, as, as you will mention, but it's also because they're contending with um, a lot of maintenance issues and safety inspe- inspection um, checks. But, but turning into the, the, the water uh, temperature issue, the threshold, uh, the upper threshold is about 30 degrees for, for the, the, the rivers to have um, enough cooling capacity to cool the reactors in order for, for them to uh, function at full capacity. But we've seen um, nuclear, um, nuclear output sort of dwindle in this past uh, few, few weeks, and that's due to the increased, um, increased uh, water temperatures that we're seeing. Uh, and again, it turns into this, uh, into this uh, sort of scenario where an extended, um, you know, extended irregularity in, in water temperatures could curtail um, this, wow. this base load power even further. And, and what this means is that uh, France is turning into a net importer of power, uh, reversing its historical position as a net exporter of power um, to, to the rest of Europe. So it, it's sort of crunching um, all of the continent uh, by, by not having this nuclear output. Interesting. A major, major issue that's going to continue to be worth monitoring going forward. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Patricio Alvarez. Coming up on the program, we talk Porsche. With an IPO likely on the horizon, we dive into what that might mean for the luxury car brand. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies in 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 13 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, we really have the potential this year to have a very exciting IPO coming, and it'll be coming out of Europe. Porsche, talking about coming public here, let's break it down with senior European automotive analyst Michael Dean. So, Michael, talk to us here about this Porsche IPO. When do you think it will happen? How big will it be? And and what does it mean for Volkswagen, which is the parent company of Porsche? Sure. So um, Porsche had an investor day a couple of weeks ago um, where they set out their medium term plans. They're looking for a sort of EBITDA margin, not too far Ferrari. Um, and then they're going to make, Volkswagen is going to make a decision on whether to have the IPO. And that's penciled in for 4Q. What does it mean for Volkswagen? Well, it's the potential to actually extract some value from some of their brands. So with Volkswagen um, valued at about 80 billion euros at the moment, we think that Porsche on a similar valuation to Ferrari could be worth and think between 60 and 80 billion euros. Wow. So what are the other brands that Volkswagen owns? Because I, I just, you know, over the last couple of decades, they've just gotten so big. Yeah, so they've got Audi, they've got Skoda, they've got Seat. But importantly, they've got Lamborghini, which we think is worth about 13 billion. And they have Bentley as well, which has finally come back to profitability and it's probably worth another 10 billion. So they have a nice portfolio of brands that are worth way in excess of their current market cap. So the way to extract some value... Um, would be to to IPO some of these brands, and that's what they're proposing with Porsche. I know Porsche has a unique, I guess, voting ownership structure. There's a family in there. If you can, dumb it down for me and explain what's going on there. Yeah, so there's there's two elements to this. There's the Porsche holding company, Porsche SE, which had the failed takeover of Volkswagen back in the noughties, and uh, they ended up selling the manufacturing business to Volkswagen, but they ended up with 50 3% 3% of um, Volkswagen ordinary shares. So they're a big sort of player in this. Yeah. And they're going to end up with a 25% ordinary stake, bear with me, in a potential Porsche IPO. But what's actually being listed is 25% of the preference shares. So the Porsche will be split into ordinary and preference shares. The ordinary have the voting shares. They go to, or 25% will go to the Porsche family. And then the preference shares, non-voting, will be issued onto um, the stock market. Okay, so they'll keep some control there. So, all right, so if, if I'm a potential investor in this Porsche IPO, what are the comps I use? Like, what's a good company to compare Porsche against? Yeah, so Ferrari, um, you know, if we look at um, Porsche, it has two elements to it. It has the luxury side of things, so that's with the 911 in particular. Um, it has the SUVs with the Cayenne and the Macan. Um, sorry, three elements. It also has the tech side, the almost Tesla-like side. 
because it has the TACAN, um, it's going to electrify the McCann in the next 12 months. So they could actually have 50% of the cells could be BEV by 2025. So as well as having the luxury wow. angle, so you could compare it to Ferrari, there's a potential that it might get some sort of Tesla tech sparkle uh, because of its being one of the leading uh, legacy automakers in terms of BEV. So they would really, from the electric vehicle perspective, boy, that would be a very, very cool product in the marketplace in terms of that luxury marketplace to have an electric vehicle option. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, they've got Ferrari type margins, but, you know, they're, they're electrifying much quicker than anyone else. So, you know, the Taycan overtook 911 cells last year by about 1,000 units. It sold 41,000 units. And this Emacan could potentially sell as many as the combustion engine version, uh, w- which was 80,000 units. So, you know, they, they could have significant best sales. Plus the, the Boxster, the 718, is going to be fully electric by 2025 as well. So that's where we get to about 50% of their products being bevs by the middle of the decade. Wow, that would be impressive. All right, so what's the market out there for, I mean, for these, you know, high-end cars? I mean, you know, there's, you know, we've got an energy crisis certainly over there in Europe, most pronounced. We've got uh, higher interest rates. We've got a, a potential for a recession sometime late this year, next year. What are sales like in, in the high-end part of the auto market? Yeah, they're very strong. So, you know, Ferrari is pretty much sold out for its current product range in their complete production run. So many of their vehicles only run for two or three years. So completely sold out across their range. Uh, Lamborghini, very similar, although they've got new products coming out next year. And then Porsche, if you want to get a 911, you know, you're talking about a 12 month plus waiting time. So, you know, in terms of the luxury sector, not seeing a pullback in terms of terms of demand at this point not saying it won't happen um but you know history tells us that uh, you know luxury car sales are pretty immune to a recession yeah and it, so how about on the supply side i know the auto industry was kind of the poster child for the shortage of uh, microchips because there's so much electronics uh and computing power in automobiles these days what's the status of that uh, for the auto companies you cover yeah so uh, at the moment uh, many companies still suffered in the first half of this year and what they were doing, they were prioritizing their high margin products. So the Porsche would have been the 911. With Mercedes, it would have been, you know, the S-Class. And uh, they've been quite successful. So even though volumes have been lower, margins uh, have been much better than expected. So as supply chain constraints ease in the second half, and that's what all the companies are saying, it's going to be interesting to see as um, production normalizes, can pricing be maintained at these high levels? And, yeah, that's a big question mark in the second half of this year and into 2023, pricing. It's interesting here. I guess a question I have uh, for you and for Kevin Tynan, who follows the, the industry here in the U.S., is are the days gone when I pull onto a lot and there's you know two or 300 cars on the lot and I can just pick one out? It seems like they're not making as many cars. The dealers aren't carrying as many cars. Uh, and therefore, the incentives for buyers may not be there as well. Give us a sense of just kind of the overall landscape. Yeah, that, that's certainly the case, particularly in the U.S., where with some um, models, you're actually paying a premium to get these cars off the lot. So inventory has been run down, and that's why even if we see a slowdown of orders in the second half, because the companies have to rebuild their inventory channels, production should still be strong. It just depends by how much do they uh, rebuild inventory. And the key is, you know, just to have enough and not to have to incentivize these products. So price discipline has never happened in the past for automakers. If they can get it right this time, then you know, it's a certainly a, a different business model for them going forward. And into your question, no, you won't be able to just go to a dealer's lot and pick a, pick a car um, off from the forecourt. Yeah, we've seen this in a lot of industries, though, when, when, you, when you think about price stability and things like that, and are they going to have discipline and not kind of raise production to, to meet demand? I mean, it just takes one big automaker, doesn't it, to just say, no, we're going to crank up production and try to go for market share. No, you're completely right. And, you know, why pricing power has been strong when the economy's been okay, it's certainly a different matter if we fall into a recession and people are coming back. It's kind of wait and see. The company say it will be different this time, but history tells us uh, that's not necessarily the case. Right, and good stuff there. Good stuff. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior European uh, Auto Analyst Michael Dean. Coming up on the program, we check in on the consumer staple sector. Are some companies looking to make big changes heading into the second half? You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BIGO on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 25 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. We'll be here each and every week at this time tapping into our Bloomberg Intelligence analysts covering some 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. Now we turn to the consumer staple sector. Some of these companies could be looking to make big changes in the second half of this year. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst Ken Shea. Ken, you've followed the big, big companies, the big consumer staples companies. Uh, you have, and those companies have a great you know, feel for what's going on with the consumer. But there's also a side of the companies that you cover where there's a lot of deal making. And there could be some spinoffs and some changes in your sector uh, the remaining, remainder of this year. What are you looking for? Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, a recent study that the Bloomberg Intelligence consumer staples team did is we we, take, we took a look at the um, consumer staples sector stock performance over the past three years. We chose three years because, you know, right in the middle of that time frame, you had this pandemic going on. And intuitively, you would think that when consumers are stocking up on toothpaste and, well, beer and <laughs> cigarettes and yep. things like that to buckle down, you would think that the, these sectors would have thrived. We're talking about packaged foods, beverages, tobacco, household products uh, type companies. And while they kind of did during that period, it was also kind of a transient benefit. And what we're seeing is those sectors have all under – that sector has underperformed with all those major industries, the ones I just mentioned. All of them have underperformed. So our thought is that, you know, given the macro backdrop where you see a lot of big companies outside consumer staples like GE and IBM and J&J and lately 3M are all finding a way to – better focus their businesses by having asset sales and streamlining. We think that is going to uh, occur in the consumer staples group as well. And it's certainly ripe for it. I mean, some of the companies, you know, these big consumer staple companies, they're just conglomerates to, to certain degrees. Talk to us about Altria, because what always fascinated me about Altria, A, it's that people still smoke, but B, that they own a big piece of AB InBev, the big brewer there, and that seems like something that they could monetize. Yeah, that's right, Paul. So one of the companies, um, and there were a few that we identified as being particularly uh, well suited to um, you know, have a, some kind of right sizing activity, uh, would be Altria. You know, this is a company whose share price is down some 35, 40 percent from its 2017 high. As you may know, it's a holding company for the largest U.S. tobacco company, uh, Philip Morris USA, makes Marlboro cigarettes. You know, cigarette consumption continues to fall. It's in secular decline. And I would argue this company really hasn't done a lot. You know, it's tried to do some things, but hasn't done a lot in terms of moving the needle uh, to diversify away from that declining business. And so at the same time, it's sitting on this asset, a 10% equity stake in Anheuser-Busch InBev, which is struggling to increase its dividend. It slashed its dividend over the last few years when it you know, acquired a SAB Miller and, and took a lot of debt on their balance sheet. You know, our thought is that the company would be well suited to monetize that 11 to 10 to $11 billion asset and diversify faster beyond cigarettes. It just seems to be a common sense thing for me to do. What could a company, like a tobacco company, because you've, you've had decades covering the tobacco industry and then the evolution of the industry, a company like Altria, you know, and these tobacco companies, how can they realistically diversify and, and really make their cigarette business almost of a a passive type of thing? Well, a lot of the strategy they've um, tried to do, Paul, is to move to the non-combustible side. You know, a lot of studies have shown that it's not the nicotine that causes harm, it's the combustion that's inhaled, like a cigarette. Uh, cigarettes account for about 90% of U.S. tobacco sales, but they've tried to diversify into e-cigarettes and through, the, through a partnership with Philip Morris International, its former sister organization, which does, doesn't seem to be working out too well with its uh, heat not burn product. Uh, what has worked out to the company's credit, though, is the Copenhagen and Skoll and oral tobacco area, those smokeless pouches yep. people um, put in their mouth. Uh, but it's moved slowly. It's also made a small investment in the cannabis sector through a uh. Canadian cannabis equity stake. Uh, so that's kind of its, its strategy to date, kind of an adjacency strategy. You figure if, what, if a consumer is going to smoke and likes tobacco, maybe they like these other things as well. But to your point, there's limited adjacencies in the world of tobacco. The cannabis market, you're the expert here at Bloomberg on the weed business. Just give us an overview of kind of where we are in terms of, I think, like a federal decriminalization here thing. Like state by state have, have legalized it, but they really need a federal uh, legalization. Is that something that's 
possible? I think it is possible, but it's going to take some time. It's probably not going to happen under this presidential administration. I would think that as we get closer to 2024, I I would be surprised if it wasn't uh, one of the key issues that distinguishes between the two big political parties, and that is the legalization of cannabis, which allows companies to sell it. You know, we talk about uh, decriminalization and things like that. You know, that's nice uh, that that people won't won't go to jail. (laughs) But in terms of companies making money, they need to have it federally legal so they can act more like consumer product companies and have the scale that's necessary to cross state bounds and 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 have have, have, have uh, you know consumer banking services like other companies right uh, but it's a few years away though unfortunately paul all right our thanks to bloomberg intelligence senior analyst ken shea coming up on the program we turn to the fed will they hike too much or do too little to fight inflation you're listening to bloomberg intelligence on bloomberg radio providing in-depth research and data on 2000 companies in 130 industries you can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 39 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. On Friday, Fed Chair Jay Powell signaled that the central bank is likely to keep raising interest rates and leave them elevated for a while to stamp out inflation. And he pushed back against any idea that the Fed would soon reverse course. In current circumstances, with inflation running far above 2 percent and the labor market extremely tight, estimates of longer run neutral are not a place to pause or stop. July's increase in the target range was the second 75 basis point increase in as many meetings. And I said then that another unusually large increase could be appropriate at our next meeting. We are now about halfway through the intermeeting period. Our decision at this September meeting will depend on the totality of the incoming data and the evolving outlook. At some point, as the stance of monetary policy tightens further, it likely will become appropriate to slow the pace of increases. All right. It is always busy time for those folks that look at the interest rate environment. We've got interest rates going up. The question is, how much more will they go? up? How much longer will they be going up? And for all that discussion, we always bring in our good friend Ira Jersey. He's the chief U.S. interest rate strategist for uh, Bloomberg Intelligence. And so, Ira, you know, I know we talked to you a lot about the rate market because that's a big, big driver of equity markets, of the bond markets, of pretty much everything out there, not to mention the housing market. We've got rising rates. I guess the debate, Ira, is how more, how much more does the Fed have to go? How aggressive will it be and over what time frame? How are you kind of kind of baselining it right now? Yeah, so the the market is still pricing for the Federal Reserve basically to, to hike another 100 basis points, 1% this year, and then maybe another 25 uh, early next year. And, uh, you know, the I think the risk is, is that they, they go a little bit further. You know, the market, when when they listened to Jay Powell after the July Fed, Federal Reserve meeting, and, he, and Jay Powell said, we're going to start hiking at a slower pace, he didn't say that we were going to stop hiking altogether or when or how far they were going to go. The two things that he he said was, one, we're going to hike at a slower pace into 2023. So, you know, basically saying that there were going to be some hikes next year, according to their forecasts, number one. And then number two, he pointed us toward the dot plot, that thing that comes out four times a year with the summary of economic projections and the uh, with, with what all of the members of the Federal Open Market Committee, the Fed's policymaking board, where they think interest rates are going to be, assuming their forecasts play out. So and and a preponderance of those has interest rates at four or slightly above four uh, percent for the federal funds rate. So you're talking about you know maybe another hundred base points this year, another fifty to seventy five basis points next year. And, and I personally think that the risk is that they go a little bit beyond that. And and again, go slow. So so the idea, Paul, that they're going uh, going to go start going at twenty five basis point increments again, I think it's just their way of signaling that they're going to start to calibrate exactly where the endpoint is for their interest rate hikes. That's interesting. I guess. And, and another thing the Fed has said is, you know, we're, we are data dependent. And so, you know, when I look at some of the data, particularly out of the housing market, it's become pretty clear that the housing market has begun to roll over, that maybe we've seen the peak. Um, how does the Fed think about that? It's such a big part of the economy and, and uh, consumers' uh, net worth. 
Well, in, in fairness, they probably like it because they they need some portions of the economy to slow down significantly in order for people to stop spending. Right. So yeah. so so when you think about financial conditions being easy and the housing market continuing to rise, that creates a wealth effect. Right. So when the stock market goes up and the, and the housing market goes up, that creates a feeling that you're wealthy. And that means that you will continue to spend because you, you you're like, OK, well, I have these assets that make my net worth pretty high and I just feel rich. So therefore, I'll, I'll spend. So, so there, there is a thought that by having the stock market well off its highs now, although you know it's come back a lot off its lows as well, um, but the housing market start to roll over, which for most people, their largest single asset is their uh, is their home. That um, that that maybe the, over time, people won't feel quite as rich as they were, and, and therefore they'll they'll slow down their spending at least a little bit. But when you look at other data, Paul, you know when, when you look at a lot of data for uh, for the job market, for yep. example. Uh, you look at even retail sales data, for uh, for example, we, we talked about that on one of the other shows that you host. And and one of the things that I mentioned was, look, look at the uh, control group in there. Look at what people are spending their money on and excluding gas. It was really strong in July. Yep. So even though you're seeing some sectors roll over, you have other sectors that are still uh, really on fire in terms of in terms of things like sales and turnover generally. And there's a lot of data that we're probably going to get between now and that late September meeting when the Fed does meet, we'll, and which will be highly anticipated once again. So there'll be a lot of data for them to discount. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. So this is an unusual period where there's actually eight weeks between the two Fed meetings. Usually there's there's uh, six or seven. Uh, this time there happens to be eight. So they're going to get a whole nother month's worth of data. So they're going to get another CPI report. They're going to get the August jobs report. They're going to get the re- next retail sales report. They're going to get all the ISM surveys, right? The global PM, the, the pur- purchasing managers numbers from, um, f- from around the world. So they're going to have a lot more data in order to analyze. But but I still don't think that, that that data is going to significantly change their general outlook that it's going to f- cause them, for example, to stop or even to slow down that significantly. I would be pretty surprised if they didn't go 50 basis points in September. Um, you know, There's still a debate between uh, maybe they'll go 75, which is certainly possible um, if the data reaccelerates. But but I think as your base case, you have to think, look, it's 50 basis points in September. But to me, that's not as important as what they're going to come out with in, in terms of their dot plot and in terms of how they're thinking about how the economy is going to shape up for 2023. And in September, we will get that summary of economic projections. So it'll be important from now until that September meeting to listen to what some of the Fed speakers are saying in terms of their own outlooks for, um, you know, they'll call it medium term, right? So the next kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, and, and when they talk about their medium term outlook, you want to take that to heart because that'll show up in their summary of economic projection. All right. Good stuff. As always, Ira Jersey, uh, chief U.S. interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. Now we turn to how news from the Fed might impact the bond market. To dive in, we welcome Bloomberg Intelligence Director of Credit Research, Noel Hebert. Noel, thanks so much for joining us here. I'd love to just lay the land about, I want to take advantage of your experience in the bond market. Talk to us about how you think about that first half of 2022, we saw negative returns like we've never seen before. I'd love to get your perspective on that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, certainly pretty close to unprecedented in terms of uh, (laughs) the pain that was distributed pretty much across all uh, spread assets, but certainly corporate credit as well. And I mean, you know, it's very uncommon, obviously, historically to come into the year sort of with a confluence of both very low rates and very low spread. Uh, so, you know, when we had sort of this dynamic as we pushed through the year with, you know, both the inflation headwinds, which people were sort of reluctant to price in, but started to price in in earnest as we moved through the first quarter and particularly uh, into the second quarter of the year and spread followed suit because people just got very nervous about duration. You know, it obviously translated into a painful experience for everyone. But the I guess the irony of it all is it only pushed yields back up to you know, not exactly uh, usurious levels. We're still right. only in the mid fours. We never even touched 5%. When I heard you know, experts like you, people with a lot of experience say it was, you know, quote unquote, unprecedented first half performance, ignoramuses like me, equity guys like me say, oh, I just got to go in and buy it. When I hear somebody say something like that, I just go, in, I need to go in there and buy it. Would I be wrong to just kind of go in and buy some investment grade bonds and buy some high yield bonds just because... At the entry points, it's too attractive? Well, I guess it depends on what sort of horizon you have. I mean, right. I think if you've got a, a relatively shorter horizon, I'm not sure that now is the most compelling time. 
because you still have, obviously, the inflation headwinds and you have, obviously, these recession concerns squirreling simultaneously. So you could still see both pressure from the rates market, as Ira, uh, you know, sort of alluded to, but also thinking through in terms of what the expectations are for spread. I mean, if we do go into a recession investment grade right now, you're talking about 140 basis points, give or take. That typically gets closer to 200 in a recessionary environment. Uh So there's still some potential price pressure there. So are you guys at Bloomberg Intelligence running kind of recession scenarios and like what sectors may be more at risk or better positioned? How do you guys think about that with your scenarios? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, one of the things, so, so absolutely we do that. I think one of the challenges this time around is this isn't an environment we've seen for four decades, right? So, and the market's Obviously, you know, in the 70s and early 80s, we're not the same as markets are today. So it's very hard to sort of anticipate how markets will respond. And a lot of that also has to do with how long is your recession going to be? What is the Fed monetary policy response going to be? That said, I mean, you tend to sort of favor if you think, you know, financials are in sort of a a more favorable backdrop than certainly they were in the financial crisis. They're certainly more discounted than they have been in a very long time versus all other sectors your consumer staples, those kinds of sectors tend to be much more resilient in that sort of backdrop that tends to be incrementally favorable to duration once you get into it. So given that performance that we were just talking about for the first half of the year, did we see funds, investors just flee the bond market? I don't know whether you look at ETF fund flows or anything like that, but it was just, again, quote unquote, unprecedented. I wonder if that just shocked some people that maybe aren't hardcore fixed income investors. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, you obviously had a ton of retail flows and a a ton of, you know, sort of cross asset flows and that sort of thing. And I think it's important to sort of, I mean, obviously, we threw unprecedented around in terms of the downdraft or the drawdown that we saw through the first half, but we were saying unprecedented on the upside for many years. So I think it's all sort of in balance. So, and we've seen flows obviously return in earnest over the last six weeks or so, both in investment grade and high yield. So people are certainly chasing back into credit assets, maybe a little bit premature, but on net, if you've got, you know, a 12 or 18 month window, it's probably not too bad. Good stuff. As always, Noel Hebert, he is the director of credit research for Bloomberg Intelligence. That's this week's edition of Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2000 companies and 130 industries. And remember, you can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. It's 57 minutes past the hour, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. 